Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's presentation of Roll Out the Rain Barrel. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment. Um, just sit tight and we will um, get started in a moment here. So thanks for your patience. Okay, so let's get started. So good evening, everyone, again, and welcome to Roll Out the Rain Barrel with MMSD. My name is Kelly. Um, I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for Milwaukee Public Library, and we're very excited to welcome uh, Jay Fiker from MMSD, who will um, tell you everything you need to know about rain barrels and rain barrel installation and all the wonderful things that MMSC does for um, the uh, Milwaukee Metropolitan Service Area. Um, so also joining me today is Lydia, who is our Tippecanoe Branch Library uh, librarian. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A and we will have some time at the end of the presentation to answer those. Um, and you will see that your microphones are muted. So if you'd like to chat amongst yourselves, feel free to use the chat function. Um, otherwise, uh, let's get started. So I will hand it over to Jay. Okay, thank you, Kelly and Lydia. And welcome everybody to tonight's Rain Barrel Workshop. I'm happy to be here. My name is Jay. I'm a project manager here at MMSD and also work with the Fresh Coast Guardians kind of program. We'll learn a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, I work with uh, MMSD and work really on kind of teaching residents how to manage water on their property. So, hence the rain barrels. But just to kind of get out the sort of the basics of getting the free rain barrel, you, there's a few requirements. You have to live in our service area which is essentially Milwaukee County and then some outlying areas. And you'll see a map in a second. Um, must have pre-registered. And then we only give one per owner occupied household. So if you've gotten a free rain barrel before, you're not eligible um, for another one. Uh, and then just be present during the entire presentation. And then at the end, we'll give you instructions uh, on how to um, get your rain barrel. So here we go. Here's the outline of the presentation. First, we're just going to talk about what MMSD does and how it affects everyone, and why you would maybe want a rain barrel, and how to install and maintain that rain barrel, and then what else you could do to protect the Great Lakes and also your property. So MMSD is the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. We are not the city of Milwaukee. That's something that people get confused about sometimes. We're a regional government agency and one that protects public health. We're actually sort of a public health agency first, which I don't think everyone thinks of, but if we did not clean the wastewater, it would be a pretty messy situation out in our rivers and lakes. So we really do protect public health and the environment through that um, cleaning the water before we release it back into the lake. And so we serve, this is the service area in the gray boundary here. I have a enlarged mouse here to kind of help show you that. Uh, so that's our service area. It's the Milwaukee County minus South Milwaukee and then some outlying suburbs here. We serve over 1 million customers, all these municipalities, and that's over 400 square miles. Right. The main two things that we do is we take all the dirty water. So when you shower, flush the toilet, do laundry, all that water comes down to our treatment plant under the Hone Bridge called Jones Island. And also we have another one in Oak Creek and that's in, uh, yeah, along the lake there. So we take the dirty water and we clean it. it, takes about 24 hours and then we release it back to the lake after it's been cleaned. <clears throat> another thing that we do that not everybody understands or knows is that we also manage flooding. So we are in charge of the rivers or most of the rivers in Milwaukee County and making sure that we reduce the risk of flooding in our area. 
So that's another thing. And that kind of comes into play with the rain barrels. So you'll see that. And MMSD is actually internationally known as one of the best at doing this. We capture and clean 98.5% of the water that comes to our system. But we're trying to get that last 1.5% um, so that we, we can keep our lakes and natural resources as clean as possible. One key thing to understand is that we are, again, I said, we're not the city of Milwaukee. We do not take the water out of the lake and uh, clean the water for your tap. We just take the dirty water and clean it and manage flooding. So, so <clears throat> where when it rains in our area, we're just gonna talk about kind of what MMSD does and why we're talking about rain rails today. But when it rains or sleets or snows in our area, and in this area, it's every year it's around 34 inches, that water has, has to have a place to go. And so on the left here, in a natural environment or before development, almost all that water either goes down, soaks in the ground and infiltrates, or it goes up in evaporation. And just a very small amount runs off, so only 10% runs off. But in developed areas like in downtown and the city of Milwaukee, it changes very much where only a small amount gets to soak into the ground and then also a smaller amount evaporates. And over five times of that, 55% of it runs off. And so runoff is just that sideways water that you see flowing down the street in heavy rain or off your lawn uh, across the sidewalk. That's runoff. And so kind of to emphasize that point, this is a map of um, our city, you know, downtown here, but with the rivers and wetlands that existed before we developed. So these windy blue lines are where the streams and rivers existed before we developed this, this, this area. And then the green blobs here are where wetlands existed. Um, and then in between were natural cover. So like prairies, you know, forests, things like that. So that's where the water would soak into the ground and then the wetlands would clean it and then ultimately end up in the rivers after it had been cleaned. Uh, and nature did it very well. And then we changed things. So these orange squares and things are what we call impervious surfaces. So hard surfaces like driveways and roads and you know Miller Park, all the parking lots there. And so instead of it being able to soak in the ground, it goes sideways and runs off. Another thing you might note, so all the wetlands are gone. Um, so the wetlands were here, then they kind of are covered up or developed on top of them. But also you notice these light blue lines here where the rivers exist now. And some of them are really straight because we straighten them out, try to control that with you know putting them in concrete channels and things like that. Um, so the, the water moves a lot faster. It doesn't wind like it does in this image here. So, all right, so what, whatever, basically whatever falls in the ground goes into this, these storm sewers and then ends up in our uh, wonderful rivers and lake where we get our drinking water and swim. So one of the consequences of that is a lot of pollution. This is the number one source of pollution to our water in our area is polluted runoff. So when that runoff, when that water runs off, it picks up the oil and grease and trash and yard waste and dog poop and cigarette butts and all that stuff you see in the ground. It doesn't get picked up. It goes right into our storm drains and ultimately into our waterways. So just imagine that dirty snowbank at the end of the winter and how dirty that is just melting and then going right into our lake. It's a pretty um, large source of um, contamination to our, to our valued resources. And then another one is flooding. So if that water can't soak in and get into the ground naturally, it you know has, so, has to go somewhere. So it goes to the low spots like these areas underneath bridges. Um, and then it also causes too much water to get to our rivers too fast. And so they swell and they overtop their banks and cause neighborhood flooding, localized drainage issues. So that's also a major issue. So what can be done? So what can we do to protect our waterways and our property? Some things that we can do are large scale 
stormwater management. So taking that runoff and putting it into like these big basins you see here. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the rivers to sort of naturalize and widen the area that the water can settle into um, rather than those concrete channels like you saw in the last slide. But if you remember that thing I showed a couple of maps, you know, a couple of slides ago, all of that developed area, there's not a lot of space to just put in a big stormwater basin like this. We don't have space to just put all the water in these big stormwater ponds and things like that because we have you know, houses and development. So small scale projects are also really key, hence the rain barrels. <laughs> so rain barrels are a really quick, easy way to capture some water and keep it from getting into our lakes and rivers and also making it useful. So in this presentation, we're gonna cover uh, some of the cool things about a rain barrel and then also how to install it. And then just a few other ways that you could help protect your yard and a home in Lake Michigan. So why might you want a rain barrel? I can't mention this, but it lowers how much water gets into our sewers and ultimately the lake reduces that stress on our sewers, which, you know, when basically when the pipes fill up, they can cause basement backups, they can cause overflows, things like that. So, you know, by having a rain barrel, it keeps 50 gallons, at least less of that, which also helps reduce the risk to your home and neighbors, which is good. And so instead, of, so the rain that hits your roof flows down your downspout and into your rain barrel instead of running off. Um, just to give you some perspective on how much water it can collect or you know how quickly it would fill up kind of thing. Um, a good sized roof, thousand square foot roof, um, produces 600 gallons of water in a big storm or decent storm. So you need 12 rain barrels essentially to collect that much water. And in a heavy storm, 12 gallons can go through your downspot in like a minute per minute. So in a really big storm, five minutes, your rain barrel will fill up. So it's not the only and you know like solution to fix everything, but it's a small way to get started. That you know, imagine everybody had a rain barrel in our area, we'd have you know 50 million gallons that we were keeping out of the waterways. Okay, so we're just going to get into the details of what comes with the rain barrel that you would get um, at the end of this presentation or the certificate you'll get. So what it does, you're gonna get a rain barrel and you're gonna kit for installation. So the barrel um, obviously comes with a barrel and also a lid, but then we have these parts you see over here. So the fill hose, uh, the fill hose seal, which is kind of a big rubber gasket sort of thing to help connect it to the rain barrel. A spigot, so the faucet kind of turn out in the rain barrel and all these other parts that are key and I'll bring them up as we go. So the tools you, you would need to install this are just safety gloves and glasses, a uh, Phillips screwdriver, just a pencil or pen or way, one, some way of marking, like a Sharpie, measuring tape or ruler, a level, and a power drill. Another thing we recommend is getting some crushed gravel, especially if you're putting it into an area that had plants before to kind of help level out that ground. Sometimes it's called paver base. And then getting a good stand or base. Now with this rain barrel, you don't absolutely have to have a stand because the spigot is high enough to still get water out of it, but we sort of recommend it because it helps give some more pressure out of the barrel. All right, so here are the steps. So first you sort of assemble the barrel. I mean, it comes, you know, as a solid barrel, but then you want to put these pieces in. So you put the small threaded seal into the two front holes. So there's a lower hole for draining the barrel and then the one where you put your spigot, which is here. These rubber pieces you kind of squeeze and push into the barrel and just get them so they set nicely, nice and flat. And then you put the cap on the bottom one and you put the spin the spigot in there. Um, it's important to make sure that you're not cross threading it. So you're putting it nice and straight into there. Um, I will point out that these spigots that come with your barrel are plastic. They're not the best in the world. I mean, they're free, they come with a barrel and that's, that's, that's nice, but you can get a replacement for this, like a, a brass one or a metal one at you know a hardware store for like $3. So that would probably 
ultimately last longer, but these will work for um, a good while too. And then the next step is to figure out which side of the downspout makes most sense for your rain barrel. So maybe you have like, you know, like a gas um, meter that's going into your, your house and you don't, you don't wanna put your barrel there or you have a, a nice plant you don't wanna put your rain barrel on top of. So just kind of figure out which side of the barrel you're going to um, have it. So you're gonna put it on the side. <laughs> and then once you do that, you use, you have a hole saw that comes in your kit. There's two of them. You take the smaller one, attach it to your power drill, and then drill into this, a pre-marked hole. So you can kind of see there's like a little dimple here. There's one on the left and there's one on the right. So depending on which side you're putting your rain barrel, that's the side you're gonna drill this hole. So you go ahead and drill through there with that hole saw. Then set your barrel side. Now that you know that's where you're gonna put it. If you have it on grass, you're gonna to wanna to remove the turf grass there uh, or just kind of level it out with a shovel or rake. And then if you have a tamp, like you see here, you can tamp the gravel. You can put some gravel down and tamp it. Um, if you don't have a tamp, you can also use like a big block, something heavy that can kind of flatten that surface. I know not everyone has a tamp, we have them. Um, but they're a good tool for flattening the ground. Might be able to rent one too. Um, but that's just a good way to kind of make the ground nice and sturdy. And after you get a nice level base uh, of the ground, you can put on some blocks or you can do like, you know, four by fours that are pressure treated or weather resistant, make a base out of that. Do not use untreated wood that will rot over time. Uh, yeah, and then you set those down, you make sure they're good and level both directions. This doesn't have to be like perfectly, perfectly level, but the closest, you, the closer you can be, the better. Um, and then put your barrel back onto the, the base, now that you've had your base there, and make sure you have kind of everything lined up. One thing to kind of keep in mind is that you don't want the barrel too close to the downspout because as you can see the fill hose here you will need some space because the fill hose is about eight inches long or so but you don't want to put it right next to the downspout because you need that space for the hose to fit in there um, so but once you kind of figure out where you're going to put your barrel you can lay a lev your level across it if you have a, a nice long one or you can put a, a board on top of your your barrel with the lid off so you put your board across there and from the bottom of your board or your level, from the bottom of your board or level, you measure down about three inches and then you mark the downspout. So this is essentially putting the hole in the downspout three inches below the top of the barrel. Um, if it's two and a half inches, that's okay. You just don't want it to be more than three or less than two and a half. So somewhere in between two and a half inches and three inches down is where you want to mark it. Um, one thing that's important to know is that there are different downspouts um, and where you drill is, is important. So if you have a larger downspout, which is usually three inches by four inches, you want to put it on the side. But if it's a standard downspout, which is two inches by three inches, you want to put it on the front. So that's a very key thing to remember. Um, and you can easily just measure the side that's actually three inches wide and then you'll know that's the side you're gonna go with because that's how wide the diverter is too. So there's a lot of threes in here, three inches down, drill into the three inch wide side or front of your downspout. Um, and then put the larger of the hole saws onto your drill and this is an important part too. You, when you, once you have that hole saw on there, the larger one, and you drill in, you really don't wanna to push too hard. Just let the drill do the work, uh, wear gloves, because it gets sharp uh, once it's cut. <clears throat> and just don't push too hard, because it can be that if you're pushing so hard and then you finally get through, that you'll get through the down spot and make a hole in the back of it. So you do not want to do that. So just push with a little pressure, go slow, 
be careful. And then once you've gotten through there, you just take the metal piece and you know throw that away. That comes out, there's gonna be a little disc. And then you wanna use a metal file to kind of smooth out the edges of that circle that you make because the circle you're gonna be squeezing something into in a second. Um, and it's very, very sharp. Many people have cut their hands on down spouts. So just be careful and wear gloves and safety goggles. This is the piece you'll be squeezing in there. So this piece is like kind of the magic of this rain barrel. It's you squeeze it into the, that hole you just made and then open it, let it open and kind of set into the downspout. And you can see the sides here and make sure it's pointed up like this, like a cup. The sides here collect the water and then put water into this hole here, which leads to the rain barrel. Now the magic of this is once the rain barrel fills and the, the hose fills, then the, rain, the water can go back down the center of this piece and go down your downspout. And this is to protect your home uh, from getting that rain barrel overflowing right next to it. So that's really um, the key piece here is this diverter. Now, one thing you have to be aware of is that, and I'll mention it later, but if you have a lot of leaves on your roof, like that fall on your roof, you gotta clean your gutters all the time, be aware that you should have a screen on your gutters to keep from that those leaves getting down here and clogging the diverter. Um, you might wanna check this diverter, pull it out from time to time, because yeah, they can catch on here. So just yeah, squeeze that, put on gloves, squeeze that diverter piece, pop it in there, and then put the screws with the, uh, you can start them with your power drill. I would actually recommend uh, using your Phillips screwdriver to really get the last bit of tightening. You should remove this picture actually, because um, you can strip the screw uh, in the hole by using a power drill. So. All right, and then lastly, once you got that in there, you attach the hose to the diverter and the hole on top of the barrel that you drilled earlier. Uh, and then if you are using the lid as the more traditional way, like right side up, you can put screws in there as you see. But there's another way that you can install it where you just you keep it flipped upside down and then there's a screen that comes with your kit that you can put in the middle and you can put rocks and like a hanging basket or you can put soil in there and put, plant, put plants in there, which is kind of a cool way of doing it as well. And it also makes it easier to you know, quickly clean your barrel if you need to. Um, so what you use as a stand, I kind of mentioned that, either some sort of block like these you know, concrete blocks here, something sturdy or like you know, pavers. You could build a stand out of treated wood, four by fours or something like that. Um, but you don't want to use anything like that's untreated or like that's kind of not sturdy because this barrel ends up being something like 500 pounds once it's full. So just be aware of that. Uh, and then if you're not getting water in your rain barrel, it could be that your barrel is higher than that diverter, like that goes in the downspout. You got to make sure that it's at that two and a half to three inch uh, mark below the, the, the barrel lid. And then the other thing that could happen is your downspout is actually clogged with leaves or something like that. And that obviously is, prevents the water from getting in there or that diverter could be stuck or filled with leaves. So make sure that's cleaned out. And then the other thing could happen is the actual fill hose, if it's got a bunch of leaves and it could get clogged. One important note is if your roof or gutters need maintenance, so if your gutters are kind of hanging off or they're you know kind of in bad shape or your roof has a lot of those asphalt flakes that are coming off of it, the shingles are sort of falling apart. Do not put a rain barrel on until you get that kind of up, up to snuff because those little pieces of asphalt and things can get stuck again into your diverter. And also it's just not good for the water that you're trying to use. So maintenance, once you have your rain barrel installed in the, in the spring, just wash out any debris and make sure those seals are good on your rain barrel. Empty your rain barrel every few days to a week. You don't want it sitting stagnant for multiple weeks. That's not really the point. And it's just gets, it can you know get kind of nasty. So I would say within a week or two at the most, um, 
I would empty it. And then kind of like I mentioned, check for leaves or debris caught in that inverter, especially if you have a lot of trees around your house. And then in the fall around, I would say around Halloween, something like that is when you'd want to disconnect. So you're going to pull, you're going to unscrew those screws, pull out the diverter, save that for a, the next rainy day in the spring. And then you're going to attach this piece that comes through their kit called the win winterization cap. So it fits that same hole, put it in there, and you attach those same screws into the holes that you, you created. Uh, and then just leave that on for the winter. And so then you just rinse out your barrel, use a sponge or something to clean it out too. Store it upside down in your garage or basement, um, and then let it hibernate for the winter. You really don't want leaving, leaving, you want to leave this outside and have it freeze and become a big 500 pound ice cube. Uh, in addition to being just annoying and in your way, it also caused that plastic to crack and then your barrel is no longer effective once it gets warm again. So that's something to keep in mind. Just when we send out reminder emails um, through our Fresh Coast Guardians newsletter to do this, but Halloween's a good time to remember. So some questions that we get, just to kind of get ahead of uh, some of the questions that might come in. Will mosquitoes breed in your rain barrel because it's sealed to the downspout and with your cap? Um, we really don't have any issues with mosquitoes breeding. And that's also something where I kind of reference you should empty it within a week. Mosquitoes take, I think, something like 19, two or three weeks to actually go through their gestational process. So if you're using your rainwater and you're getting that um, going, you know, using in your garden things, like you won't really need to worry about that. And you should empty it anyway. So do rain barrels come in other colors? Um, not from us. They do at hardware stores and things like that. You can definitely buy some, but we just have the black one. Uh, the black one is actually made of over 85% recycled plastic, and that's partly why it's black, because they dye the plastic that's recycled all the same color, and black kind of neutralizes that. Uh, and so can you use more than one rain barrel? Yes, you can get a, a second one just and link it. I mean, you can either take a second one and put on a different downspout. You can also what they call a daisy chain. So you can make another, you can put a rain barrel next to the one you already installed and connect it with a fill hose. And then the water will go into that second barrel. And that's actually often a good way to kind of make use of the water because the second barrel is, is even cleaner than the first one. Because the first one kind of collects that first water that comes off your roof and then the second barrel is like a little bit cleaner and um, good for, you know, better for gardening and things like that. Can you paint your rain barrel? You can, but these rain barrels are more so designed not to be painted uh, or get, you know, marked up. There are processes and there are ways of doing that on our website. The one negative of that is that ultimately, if you ever thought of, return, you know, recycling it, it would no longer be recyclable. So that's one thing to understand if you do paint it. Uh, and then can you make your own barrel with a diverter kit? Yes, you can. We unfortunately do not have those types of diverter kits for like the self-made barrel, but you can buy them off um, like different websites and things. And so some successes from, the, from our rain barrel program through these workshops and selling them, um, different donations to schools and things like that. We've distributed over 24,000, which adds to over a million gallons when it rains. So if we keep doing this, we can get more and more gallons kept out of our rivers and lakes and sewers. Um, and so I kind of mentioned it earlier, like this is just 50 gallons. It's a good start, but it doesn't solve all the issues. Really another great way of helping protect the lake is installing a rain garden. And a rain garden is simply you know, something at the end of your downspout or on the side of your driveway or something like that, where you have an area of grass that you just dig down a few inches, put some good soil in there and plant native plants, uh, perennials to help soak up that water. We have all kinds of instructions and videos and we do workshops on how to do that, but really it's not that hard. I installed a small one last year in a couple hours. Uh, obviously the bigger, the more complicated, but even my small one, I've never seen it overflow. It soaks up all the water. And so 
like in a storm where rain guard rain barrel can only capture 50 you know rain garden can capture 500 gallons so they're they make a bigger impact than if you are interested uh, just go ahead to our website and check it out another thing you do is just simply remove turf grass and replace with native plants or other perennials um, turf grass really once it's saturated doesn't soak up a lot of water um, it basically becomes another hard surface or impervious surface once it's saturated and water flows over it. So if you put in native plants with these deep roots, um, they soak up a ton more water. You know, and they're also like adapted to this climate, so you don't need to water them, the native plants. So that's also a cool factor. One thing you can do right now without doing much more than just using your phone, you can sign up for something called the water drop alert. So the water drop alert basically texts you when we're going to have a really, really big storm coming and reminds you to empty your rain barrel. So, you know, you know, you're going to get fresh water and you're also getting that extra volume ready to capture um, for the storm coming. And then you can also like maybe not do that extra load of laundry that you were thinking about doing or taking a really long half an hour shower. So just using less water in general can also help just keep the volume um, and the treatment plants from getting overwhelmed. So this phone number, 414-296-4422, you just text the word water drop and you'll get um, alerts. And trust me, we do not inundate you with alerts unnecessarily or advertise to you every week. It's just when there's something to tell you about. So just, just to do too good. Another thing you can do, we have something called a rain track. It's just basically a pamphlet that has a bunch of different ways that you can help protect your home from water. So it's inside and out. So looking at you know, your sewer pipe that goes out to the street, uh, just maybe grading your home differently, like making sure the soil is graded away from your home, just different checklists essentially that you can do around your home to help uh, manage water on your property and help reduce basin backups and prevent that water pollution. Um, it's at MMSD.com, just search for rain check. And it's a nice handy like step-by-step -step guide of how to do some of this. Some of it is actually installing a rain barrel. So you get that one checked off. And then you can also get a free t-shirt. So these t-shirts they're wearing here, I think it's been updated to a darker blue now, but just once you get your rain barrel installed, take a photo, send us the photo, and we'll send you a free t-shirt that says that you help protect Lake Michigan. And so that's another thing you can do, or you can take a photo of the lake and send it in. Tell us why you love water and why you want to protect Lake Michigan. So that's at our website, freshcoastguardians.com. <clears throat> we also have the Fresh Coast Resource Center, so that Currently is virtual, it used to be its own place, but right now it's virtual so you can uh, call us or go to our website there. And again, it's just people like me and other people I work with here that can help get you started on a project that can help manage water like a rain garden. Uh, or you know, if you needed help with your rain barrel install, like, or sorry, if you had questions about installing your rain barrel, um, we don't have people that can come out and install them, unfortunately, I wish we did. But uh, we can at least give you advice and help you walk through it we also have a really like good recap video of how to install it if you're more into a video um, for learning how to install the rain barrel that's on our website as well oh something messed up here um so to get your rain barrel you again just to review that you have to live in the service area pre-registered just one per owner occupied household and you've been here so good job um and then just not gotten one before so now this survey uh here will go into the chat so once we're done with this um, you can fill out that survey just asking you for your basic information your name and address and your email um, and that's just to like we don't use it for anything other than just uh, verifying that you haven't gotten a rain barrel before and that you live in the service area. So just to kind of go through that eligibility, just understand you're not going to get this immediately. You're not going to get the certificate tomorrow. Um, 
I'm in the middle of <clears throat> a lot of different things like the plant sale pickup. I don't know if you know about our plant sale, but we do have a plant sale that goes in the spring and people are picking those up this weekend. So I'm the one that looks through all this. So I won't, I won't get this to you tomorrow, but probably by next uh, week, you'll get an email with a certificate to come claim your rain barrel here at our headquarters. And there'll be instructions on how to get here and all that. So if you have any questions, again, you can contact us via our website or that phone number. You can follow us on social media and we have a newsletter too. So the newsletter, like I referenced a little bit earlier, um, will remind you when you should winterize your rain barrel and also when to bring it back out. It will tell you about that plant sale I mentioned, the native plant sale, which is like a really good deal for native plants uh, and other workshops and things that relate to this to help you get started on managing the water on your property. All right, oh, so let's leave that page up and I'm open for questions. Hey everyone, so we have that link pasted in the chat as well. So when you click that, um, you'll just enter in your information as Jay described. So it's in the chat, um, just click that. It should take you right to the, um, the survey page. Yeah, so there we go. It's up on the screen there. Oh, nice comment from Tia. Um, super excited. Oops, I lost the comment. Let me see. Super excited to pick up my plants from the plant sale this weekend. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you, Tia. Let's see. Um, Diane would like to know, is the native plant sale still going on? Yeah, I was just going to put up a different link. Um, so no, it's, it's a pre-order sale, and that's partly how we get them a little cheaper is because you buy them sort of February, March, and sometimes it goes into April, but usually it's by the end of March, it closes. So you order ahead of time and pay for them. And then that way the greenhouse knows they have their order and they just grow them and then they drop them off um, in June. So this year it's on Saturday. Um, so it's a pre-order sale, so that would be no. I'm gonna put a link in the chat though to help you connect with other Native plant sales, we don't make any money from them. We're just trying to get more natives out there. So I'm, I'll put a link in the chat to other sales. I think Urban Ecology Center does one. Uh, and Audubon Society does one. And there's like other organizations like Wild Ones. But there's a whole list of them here. Oh, this is tough. This is okay, so here. Here's a link. The DNR maintains like a mm -hmm. other native plant sales, and there's a whole bunch more and more happening. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Yeah. So we have we have a question from um, Charlotte. Uh, do you have a recommendation for a more heavy duty spigot? I mean, I would say the best would be a brass spigot. You know, you just go into the hardware store and look for something that's brass. It's going to be resistant to weathering and things like that. But honestly, anything, <laughs> anything you get at, at the store that's metal will probably be better than plastic. Plastic just over time wears out um, and gets kind of clogged in things. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it'll work for a while, but I know that many people have called us and said, oh, it's leaking. And I mean, I'm like, I can give you another one, but it's going to end up having the same problem. So yeah, just anything that's metal, the brass would be best. We have a question from Diane. Uh, do people generally use watering cans or hoses to distribute water from the barrel? Uh, I mean, so you can use a hose and that, uh, you know, the, the really it's key, that would be key then to have a good height on it, your rain barrel. And you can, you can make your base a little higher to get that extra pressure. Um, I tend to use watering cans and my trick, I actually learned this from an intern, which at, at first sounded kind of ridiculous, but it really does work. I actually take the lid off and I dunk the watering can in it and it fills up really quickly. And I have two of them and then I walk around the yard and water with them. It's just a lot faster and I'm a busy guy with three kids and all kinds of activities. So I don't, <laughs> I don't like to wait for the hose. So, um, but if you're more patient, you can definitely use a hose. 
Nice. So we have a question here from Angela. Um, great info. Does the saw piece for drilling a hole in the downspout come with the kit? Yes, there's two different hole saws. A smaller one for drilling into the barrel and a larger one for drilling into the downspout. One thing to note though, is that if you end up like, or if you find out that you have something other than aluminum downspouts like copper, or there's sometimes people have like galvanized, like harder metal, the, the whole saw that comes with the kit um, will be a little tricky on those types of downspouts. So you might, I mean, I would contact me if you have troubles with it. I mean, it should work, but you might have to get like a more robust whole saw. Got a few more questions coming in here. Um, Jessica would like to know, is it better to keep the barrel on the shady side of the house out of the sun or does it matter? So I understand, I, so I'm thinking that that question might be related to the fact that algae could grow um, if it's in the sun, but these barrels are sort of UV resistant by being they're thicker black plastic, and that's partly why they're black too. So they don't really get a lot of sun into them, and which helps keep that algae growth. Uh, but I, I would, you know, if, if you want to be extra cautious, you can put it in the shade. But I think the most important thing with the rain barrel placement is that you're going to put it in a place where it doesn't block your way. So you're not putting it on the sidewalk where you walk all the time and it gets annoying. Uh, but, but, in also in a place that's close to where you're gonna use it. So put it by your garden as if you can, you know, or by, you know, where you're gonna put, you know, your, your flowers and stuff like that. So Heather would like to know, can you attach a hose to the spigot to use to water your garden? Do soaker hoses work? Yeah, yeah, you can. You can. I, I soaker hoses are a little tricky. Like you have to find the right one, um, because the pressure isn't really that great. Soaker hoses don't work awesome. There are some with like bigger holes, or you could actually modify it yourself and poke bigger holes into it. Um, they don't work perfect in all situations. I'll say. I think. You can have a hose like, and just kind of move it from place to place. That's probably the easier way of doing it. Um, soaker hoses, I think you can find the right soaker hose. I, I've also found that it just kind of takes forever. And so it's not really the most effective. So then you'd want to use the dunk from the top method. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the way I like it. And I mean, you can also just like have a regular hose and then just kind of move it around the garden as it empties, you know? But the soaker, I, I think I, there are some soaker hoses out there that like are kind of more quick. You know, they're not as slow, designed to drip as slowly, but the pressure in the barrel really isn't that great, you know? So it's sometimes not work that well. Okay, a few more questions here. Uh, Ellen would like to know how far away from the house should the downspout discharge? Uh, <clears throat> downspout, typically we recommend a minimum of six feet um, to 10 feet. That depends on like, you know, kind of the age of your house, how deep your basement is, but six feet is typically the rule of thumb minimum for, uh, for what we recommend. Um, and then 10 feet is like ideal. And Laura would like to know, where can you buy a diverter kit and fill hose? So, I mean, they come with the barrel. If that's, I don't know if that's what they're asking or if they, they're talking about extra ones. Um, but if it's an extra one, I think like Menards might have them, but also online. So if you type in earth-minded, uh, earth, oh, an existing barrel, yeah, earth-minded, uh, and it would be for an existing barrel, uh, and you might want to contact me too just to know a little bit more about your situation. There's a special kit called the DIY Rain Barrel Diverter Kit, I think, um, but you can contact the Fresh Coast, uh, you know, contact us form on freshcoastguardians.com 
or call and I can help you out too. But if it's, if you're trying to, if you have a rain barrel, that's like just one of those old blue ones that has nothing but just, you know, the barrel, then you're going to want the DIY rain barrel diverter kit from earth minded. And you can Google that, uh, you know, Home Depot has them online, Amazon, uh, other, uh, lots of other places, rain, actually on our website too. That's actually a good point. I put that link in there. We have, there's other like specific rain barrel um, websites that should have them as well. And this is, these are good websites to know anyways, because if down the road you lose a winter cap or you lose, you know, your diverter kit, something like that, these will sell the full kit or also just the parts that you're missing at a cheaper price than if you just go to Home Depot or something like that. Nice. So yeah, that link is in the chat, um, as well as the link to the form to fill out if you haven't done so already. Um, please click that and put in your information so you can get that certificate. Um, there's also, we I repasted the link to um, the DNR webpage about uh, native yeah. plants for your yeah. uh, edification in there. So um, check the chat window. Got a couple more questions here. Um, Sarah would like to know, so sort of related question, is there an entity that uh, they should call when a backup happens at their home? The city, whatever city or village you live in, it, you can contact them, like the DPW. Um, yeah, not, so, and that's something that's important to understand too, is that MMSD, our sewer pipes are like the highways of the sewers. We're like the really, really big ones. And then from there are your local city or village or wherever you live. They have their own sewers that connect to us. So, and then you have your own sewer that connects to your house. So when you have a backup, it's typically in your city or village's pipe. And so that's who you would want to call because ours are like the highways. We can't really necessarily trace where that or what the problem is going is coming from. It's more your city or village. Good to know. All right. And James would like to know, will you have another class? I have friends that would like to do this, but the class was full tonight. Yeah. So we're hoping to, we, you know, we, we love having them and we love to give out rain barrels. We are a little impacted by uh, the economy and, you know, supply. So there's a couple factors there. I don't want to get too in much detail or bore you with all the details, but essentially we only have so many rain barrels, so we can only do so many of these. And we also only have so many of me and other people that can present to you. <laughs> so we're working on building that network as well. Um, but I really appreciate that people do want to come to these and want to get rain barrels. Uh, I would say the best way to know when we get them, and that's how many of you might have found out, is through this newsletter that you see on the page or if it's still on there, I don't know. Um, the newsletter is really like the way to find out because we send people the link in that newsletter before it just gets released publicly. And oftentimes we don't even get to that point because it fills up. Um, but yeah, we're planning on doing more. We're actually trying to get some more in-person ones too. We, we have a rain barrel mobile that we ordered many moons ago and we're still waiting to get so that we can bring rain barrels to these libraries and get them right to you. So yes, I, I, I'm glad that people are interested. Um, okay. Laura would start. like, yeah, can put the newsletter link in the chat there. Okay. Thanks, Laura. Oh, oh. Um, you know, and I do want to mention too, um, if you are looking to watch any of these sessions um, just for informational purposes um, or edification, the library does uh, archive them on our YouTube channel. Um, so when we send out the link to this recording, we'll include a link to our channel and we have a specific green ideas playlist where all of these um, green and sustainability programs are uh, linked. So you can, you can watch them all in a loop if you'd like. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've got quite a few. Um, of course, we've done uh, uh, many with MMSD. Uh, we have some that we've done with Melinda Myers this spring. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can also sign up for 
those webinars on our website at mpl.org. We've got a couple coming up um, in June because it's pollinator month. So um, if you're interested in uh, learning how to plant a rain garden. Um, I know Jay talked a bit earlier about how that absorbs a lot more uh, water than just turf grass does. Um, you can learn how to do that with one of the videos on our um, YouTube channel as well. So they are available 24 seven on demand whenever you are so inclined. Yeah, and, I, and because it is pollinator month coming up, I mean, the rain gardens not only do they soak up the water, but they're completely made for pollinators too like the connection there you know i talk a lot about the water because then for the sewer district but those native plants are like the perfect food for pollinators and you if you plant one you will have birds and butterflies and um, bumblebees and things that you never thought would come to your yard and i i mean i can attest that it happened to me i had hummingbirds in my yard last year just going to the flowers, which is really, and I live in the city, I live in the dense part of the city, but somehow they find it. So I would encourage all of you to install a rain garden if you can, because I think they are really cool and do a lot of good things. Um, yeah, in addition to helping us soak up the water. So if you have a question, please go ahead and drop that in the chat or the q and I think we've gone through um, all the ones that have, post, have been posted so far. Um, and again, please fill out that form if you have not done so already. Tonight is your only chance to fill that out uh, for this session. So make sure you have that filled out and sent in um, for your rain barrel voucher. And there's, there's videos too about how to install rain gardens at the bottom of our Rain garden page that are helpful. We do have a few minutes uh, left in our session. Oh, thank you. Deborah says, thank you. Um, Alyssa says, thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone for tuning in this evening. Joan says, thank you. Kavita says, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Sounds like that might be it for our questions this evening. Did, did you want to leave it open for a few more minutes, Jay? I mean, I, I can wait a minute or two, sure, that's fine. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm scheduled till seven, so. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Dave. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. I really like this. Uh, can you see this image of native plants here? I'm sure you've maybe seen yes. it. Yeah. Yeah, that is such this a fantastic just, illustration. Yeah, I have it behind me at all times too. But just to show you the roots of turf grass here versus native plants. Oh. Yeah, that's astounding. And these you know, are many I, of the ones like purple coneflower. Mm -hmm. These are the ones we, you use in rain gardens. So. Oh, that's so cool. That's not and amazing. It, yeah, and I mean, something that people do get worried about at times is like, whoa, so these are gonna be like 12 feet underground. <laughs> but that's what this really shows is like what it would be in a prairie where they're searching and searching for water. If you water them and they're taken care of, they don't grow that deep, you know? That's just, if there isn't, if they're in the natural setting. <laughs> Stephanie says the uh, the modern American lawn is the biggest scam. Love the illustration. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I heard, listened to like a an essay, like an audio kind of book, but it was more like an essay, and it was I think it's something like one third, if not more, of all our clean water in this country is used to to just keep lawns green. It might even be more than that. 
but I got to get the facts right. But I know it's at least one third of, of all the clean water, like clean drinkable water is used to water lawns, which is just seems like a waste. Oh, totally. Yeah. Well, and I know like out West, I'm sure, you know, probably everyone here, you've been hearing about like increasing restrictions on um, having lawns and watering lawns because it just, it uses up so much fresh water. Um, yeah. There's the movement for like, yeah, the more natural lawns for out there. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of it, but there's a name. Yeah. But... It was the No Mo May. Oh yeah. The No Mo May. Yeah. I, that really <laughs> caught on, man. I, yeah. I, we put it out a little bit, but man, I, we, we visit sometimes like just during outreach and stuff like, you know, different neighborhoods and a lot of people are just not doing it. I think people are like the opportunity not to do something. Like, Why not? Let it grow. Yeah. I know. I tried to hold out for as long as I, I could. And um, I lasted until about May 20th or so. <laughs> Got really long though. So I'm hoping yeah. I help some pollinators and, and wildlife out there. I should find that 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 uh, that fact that somebody sent to me. Yeah, but it, oh, this is thirty to sixty percent. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like, and you don't really need like that's the thing. If you did want to keep a green lawn, you could use your rainwater. Take your rainwater. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. for the part that you have for lawn. <clears throat> Use sky water, not land water, for uh, yeah. your lawn. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we've got a couple minutes here. If anyone has any questions, we've got a couple minutes yet. And again, if you haven't filled out that form um, to request your rain barrel, please do so. I'm just going to drop that link in the chat one more time. And just if we you know if we do end up going to in person ones again, I do remember. I think you said Lydia was at Tippy Canoe. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think where this sort of whole idea you know, began with mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah. Um, for anyone here who has not yet been to the Tippy Canoe Branch Library, it's um, I would call it MPL's flagship green branch. There's lots of great <laughs> infrastructure. Um, see bios whales and a rain garden and um, permeable paving in the parking lot. And last year we put in a uh, butterfly garden. So oh. speaking of pollinators, um, and I, I feel like this time of year, those plants should be coming back. So it should look pretty green over there. Um, oh. And I know Lydia is hosting a plant cutting and plant swap program as well, several times um, this summer. So uh, we can also include some information about that in our follow-up email, um, but you can always find links uh, to our events at mpl.org. Um, we've got all kinds of, all kinds of eco-friendly and green programming coming up this summer that we're, we're really excited to share with everyone. Okay, got one more minute. Anyone has any questions? Just drop those in the chat or the Q and A. Thank you, Emily. And thanks again to everyone who is still here. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, everyone. Too, this has been really interesting and informative. You know, the nice thing um, about these sessions too is every single one we have like different questions, and you know, even if you are like. A returning attendee it's like you're always going to learn something new which is great um so so if you haven't done so already everyone um make sure you check out our uh, green ideas playlist and um just you know when you have some time um you'll learn a lot from uh jay and the folks at mmsd and linda myers about um rain gardens managing water on your property um installing rain barrels uh, we even have some author visits um and what else there is there's a ton of videos on there so lots to check out um and also be sure to stop in any mpl branch location too during the month of june we've got resources for pollinator month we've got some great book lists that you can check out for all ages 
Um, I know we've got some um, activities too for uh, kiddos. And uh, again, the uh, webinar is coming up this month with Melinda Myers for, uh, for the adults who are interested. So looks like we are uh, at time, I'll do a comment from Jean. Please post the website to verify attendance. Um, so Jean, I'm gonna drop that link again in the chat here. So um, it's the uh, the address that starts with forms.gle. So when you click that, that should take you to the web form and then you just drop your information in there and then that'll get sent to Jay. All right. Think we're good. I think so. All right. Well, thanks again, Jay, so much for hosting this session. Um, and thanks for all the work that um, you and MMSD do on a daily basis to manage our um, freshwater sources, our rainwater, you know, all of the water that um, surrounds us. So um, we really had fun learning with all of these sessions. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for hosting. Okay, right. have a great evening, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay,